Linear time invariant systems that operate on continuous time signals can be described using differential equations. And the advantage of a differential equation description is that it can account for the presence of stored energy at the time an input is applied to the system. So the type of differential equation that we're going to look at is a linear constant coefficient differential equation. And this corresponds to linear time invariant continuous time system. So the general form is to write the differential equation as a weighted sum of derivatives of the output y of t being equal to a weighted sum of weights bk times the kth derivative of the input x of t. And typically for the types of physical systems that arise in the study of signals and systems and signal processing, the order n on the left-hand side is greater than or equal to the order of derivative on the right-hand side, capital M, and so we simply describe the order of the system as capital N. And this corresponds to the number of energy storage devices that are present in the system. If you look at a simple electrical circuit as an example, here we have a voltage source representing an input x of t, and the current around this circuit representing the output y of t. And we can sum the voltage drops around this loop and obtain r times the current y of t plus 1 over c, the integral of the current, plus l times the derivative of the current has to be equal to the voltage source x of t. Now this differential equation has an integral in it yet, so we can convert it to the standard form that we've written above by taking the derivative of both sides, and that gives us 1 over c y of t plus r d dt y of t plus l d squared dt squared y of t has to be equal to d dt of the input x of t. Drawing a comparison to our general form up here, we can identify the weights a k and b k a0 is the term that multiplies the zeroth derivative of y, and that's 1 over c in this case. a1 multiplies the first derivative, which would just be r. a2 multiplies the second derivative, which is l. And then on the right-hand side, we don't have a zeroth derivative of the input x of t, so therefore b0 has to be equal to 0. And the coefficient in front of the first derivative of the input is 1. Now, if you've solved electrical circuits before, you know that you can account for the presence of initial voltages or currents. Formally, we're going to write the initial conditions as the value of y and its first capital N minus 1 derivatives at time t equals 0 minus. And in writing it this way, we're assuming that the input is applied at time 0 the values at time 0 minus, which is immediately prior to the application of the input, represent the stored energy in the system. These initial conditions actually summarize all the information about the system's past that is needed to determine the values of future outputs. And this is what is unique about differential equation descriptions. For example, if we look at the impulse response description for a linear time invariant system, we simply must know the input for all time. And we're going to look at how we solve such a differential equation, and we're going to take an approach that doesn't work for all the special cases, but nevertheless gives us a lots of insight about the behavior of such systems. So we're going to write the output y of t as a combination of two terms. y sub s of t is the so-called steady state response to the system, and this is how the system behaves if the input had been applied forever. In other words, we're under steady state conditions. And then there's another term, y sub t, which we're going to call the transient response to the system, and this tells us how the system transitions from its initial state to the steady state response. And so this form of our solution applies after the input has been applied, and therefore for times t greater than zero. Now the particular type of input that we're going to consider is x of t equals e to the st, where s is some complex number. And that particular input has a very simple form for the output. The steady state response is just h of s, 
some function of s that we'll discover in a moment, times e to the st. So if I apply this complex exponential input in a steady state scenario, I end up with a complex exponential output. And we can check and verify that this particular solution satisfies the differential equation. Notice that the kth derivative of the input x of t is just s raised to the kth power times e to the st. And similarly, the kth derivative of y sub s is also s raised to the kth power times e to the st times this constant h of s. So if we substitute the values of these derivatives into the differential equation, on the left-hand side of the differential equation, I obtain e to the st h of s, where I've factored out of the sum the terms that don't depend on k, the sum from k equals 0 to capital N of a k s raised to the kth power. And then on the right-hand side, again, factoring out e to the st as it doesn't depend on the sum k, I have e to the st times the sum from k equals 0 to m b k s raised to the kth power. Now we can cancel e to the st from both sides, and therefore we see that this pair, input and output, satisfy the differential equation, and also that h of s has to be the ratio of these two polynomials in s. And this ratio is called the system transfer function, and it tells us a lot about the system. And it's used in the study of systems far beyond our present application of differential equations the system is linear. So if I know how the system behaves with this form for an input, I can determine easily how the system behaves when the input is a sum of complex exponentials. So in this case, alpha q is some set of constants telling me how I'm adding up these complex exponentials where the parameter of the exponential is now s sub q. And for example, if we wanted to write a complex sinusoid input, then we would have an e to the j omega t and an e to the minus j omega t. We'd have a sum of two terms. And then we know that our output would involve the sum of those same two terms with the modification introduced by the system transfer function evaluated at the particular values of s cubed. Now one can solve the differential equation for other types of inputs, for example, you could use t times e to the st and find what the differential equation output is, but the additional complexity is not worthwhile for us at this point. So having found the steady state behavior of the system, we now turn our attention to the transient response y sub t. It turns out, if you think about this carefully, that if the steady state behavior satisfies the differential equation for a particular input x of t. For this overall y of t to satisfy the differential equation, y sub t has to satisfy it for an input x of t equals zero. And this gives us a key clue that we need to understand what the form of the transient response is. So my transient response satisfies the sum from k equals 0 to cap n, coefficients a k, times the kth derivative of the transient response being equal to 0. If this must be satisfied, then it turns out the transient response has to take the form a weighted sum from l equal 1 to capital N of coefficients c sub l times e to the s sub l t. But these s sub l are special. They are the roots of a polynomial known as the characteristic equation. And that polynomial is a sub n s raised to the nth power plus a sub n minus 1 s to the n minus 1 power, etc. plus a1 s plus a0 has to be equal to 0. So the roots of this equation are the values that get put in for these complex exponentials. And this assumes that none of the roots are repeated. Again, one can deal with repeated roots. It adds a level of complexity that's beyond our current interests. This also assumes that none of these roots are involved in the solution to the steady state response. Now we can check that this works, and we're going to check by just considering a term e to the SLT, since again, by linearity, if this term works, the sum will work and noting that the kth derivative 
with respect to t of e to the slt is just sl raised to the kth power times e to the slt. We see that our differential equation becomes e to the slt times the sum from k equals 0 to n of ak sl to the k. This sum here is just the characteristic equation, and by choosing s sub l to be a root of that, we ensure that this sum is 0, and therefore this particular solution satisfies our differential equation with 0 on the right-hand side. Since any particular s sub l satisfies it, then the weighted sum also will satisfy the differential equation. And these constants, c sub l, we are free to choose those. And what we'll do is pick those so that our final solution, y of t, up here, satisfies the initial conditions. So let's combine our solutions now. And if we have an input, x of t, which is a weighted sum of complex exponentials, and this is applied at time t equals 0, then the output consists of this steady state response, which now has the system transfer function evaluated at the SQs. This is in general a complex number. And then for the transient response, we have a sum of coefficients c sub l times e to the s sub l t, where s sub l satisfy the characteristic equation. And recall that the system transfer function was a ratio of polynomials and to find these coefficients c sub l, which are the only terms that are unknown in this solution, we're going to take derivatives of the output and use those to satisfy the initial conditions. This output is very easy to differentiate, again, because the only terms that depend on t are these exponentials. And so if I evaluate the derivative at time t equals 0, I obtain the sum from q equals 1 to capital Q of alpha q, h of sq, sq to the k, so this is just some constant, is equal to the sum from l equals 1 to n, c sub l, s sub l to the k. And these s sub l to the k are numbers. So if I look at this derivative evaluated at 0, the only thing that's unknown are the c sub l. So what we're going to do is use our capital N initial conditions to get a system of n equations involving the c sub l by taking these derivatives. And of course, this is the form of our initial condition. So this would be some constant equal to this, and that's a system of n linear equations involving these n unknowns c sub l, we can solve that for the c sub l. And I'll illustrate this in the succeeding video with an example. Now there's a catch to applying this particular method for the solution, and that is with respect to the initial conditions. It turns out if the right-hand side of the differential equation, the sum from k equals 0 to cap m bk d dt k, of the input, if that side contains impulses or the derivatives of impulses, then the initial conditions at t equals 0 minus are not the same in general as they would be at t greater than 0. And therefore, one would have to translate those initial conditions to a time at which this solution applies before solving for the c sub l. That process is fairly complicated and not worth our time at this point for the additional insight that it provides. Our approach here applies when there are no impulses on the right-hand side or derivatives of impulses, and that allows us to simply use the initial conditions at t equals 0 minus as being identical to those at t equals 0 plus, and we can solve this directly. So the big advantage of these differential equation descriptions for linear time invariant systems is that they allow us to account for the presence of energy storage in the system and an input that then drives the system after it's in that initial condition.